Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me here today. I'm Fred, and I'll be presenting about parameter classes and about making parameter binding a bit more user-friendly. As on the first day, Bruce already told us, there's a main difference between PowerShell and most text-based command lines that we have objects, and parameters have to somehow deal with that in order to be even semi-intuitively usable. What PowerShell does, it forces the input type into the, uh, to the parameter expected type by being fairly aggressive about converting it, trying to make it somehow fit. This works sometimes very well, sometimes less so. Anybody can tell me why this is not going to work? Exactly. Test connection wants a string as piped in parameter for computer name. And AD computer successfully converts to a string because every object has a to string method. But that will be converted into a distinguished name, not a DNS name. So you get a can't resolve name error. That is a bit of a bad because you know. A D computer obviously targets a computer, so why, why does that fit? I had a few colleagues asking me that. And the thing is, with the PowerShell system, it's still type-based. It expects the correct type or an object that is somehow of the correct type to somehow force it into it. And the moment that is no longer true, well, it fails. This is something developers are very comfortable with because they already live that every day and night and written in the code. But, well, administrators see this not working. Google next solution. Let's try this one. So, I kind of looked into this because really I think something that officially obviously points at a computer should be understandable for a computer input. Why, do, why does it have to be that complicated? And inconvenient, because even if you know about this, first you'll have to attract, extract the proper property from Active Directory computer and convert it. And the same is true for many other things. Now, PowerShell does quite a few things trying to convert input to the proper expected type. Specifically, there's two options. Option one, somebody had an what's it called again, argument transformation attribute attached to the parameter. And that's basically a conversion path. It will walk exactly that path, and either it will work or it will not. On the other hand, if you don't have that, it will try to fit the fiddly bits a bit together, so maybe works. If it's already the correct type, that's fairly easy. If the expected type is one of the core language features, like string or bool. There are some custom rules that PowerShell respects, um, making that, well, a fairly fast and efficient option because, quite frankly, those are most of the parameters will be exactly one of those types. We can register type converter to it. I like type converters, but they are not exactly intuitive for a non-developer. We could it will try to look for a constructor that has exactly one input, and that input is the actually argument type, in which case it will try to run the constructor, and if that works, without an exception, so great. It could have implicit and explicit cast, which is a c sharp -y thing where a big developer told it, you got convert to that like this. And finally, we've got iConvertible, an interface, something that Matthias tried to show us yesterday, but oh, time ran a bit out. I don't know why. All right. Now, the thing is, I like community work, I like multiplayer games, and option one is not multiplayer. It's a single player mode. Because in option one, only the person coding the argument transformation attribute has any control over what's happening. So in my books, if using the right host is worth killing a puppy for, then this is obvious, obviously an entire litter. Yes, PS Credential, I'm looking at you. <laughs> All right. 
Now, my method uses the constructor method to teach the parameter various conversion paths to make it as intuitive as possible and as easy as possible to accept input. This also has an additional feature. It allows us to maintain the original input type so we do not have to destroy connections. Kind of useful usually. All right, let's take it a little code. This is about all I'll be using PowerPoint for for today. Better. All right, first of all, for those who are not very com comfortable with the class system, if I like the comparison of a house. If an object is a house, then the class is the blueprint. And the constructor is the assembly instructions that get us from the blueprint into reality by providing construction materials. So we'll be using for this entire example the daytime as an input, because that's usually something everybody of us has at some point in his IT career encountered. And this is about as simple as a class gets. It has a constructor called daytime with a value and has a property to store it in. Uh, yes, I should probably select all of it. Now we need a function that has a parameter that expects this. Hi, Jeffrey. So, simple function. I like using get test because I don't have to worry about minus in the room if I use get alcohol, which is my second favorite one. And if you now pass a daytime object to it, it will successfully accept it and interpret it. Now, at this point, we have, well, all right, we've got, we can accept on daytime, but it's actually a lot less versatile than if you just had, had a, put a daytime in there as an expected type. Come on. You don't do that on me, I don't do it on you. <laughs> Fair deal? A piece to be listening. So let's add a second constructor. Now we have add a second conversion path to it. Because if you have a daytime parameter, you can also uh, like call it to string on the daytime and pass the string, and it will automatically parse it, which is another of these many conversion rules. So if you had a daytime that works, right now it won't work. We can try that out again up here. Hmm. Doesn't work because it doesn't know about string. It doesn't have a string construct. It doesn't have any way to convert string into its type. So yeah, no, not going to happen. Which is why we'll just add a string constructor and a method to parse it, because a separate method makes it a bit more convenient to use. If there's nothing in it, well, empty strings are evil, so we're not going to pass that. And we're just going to use daytime, daytime's parse method. And once we're going to use the current culture and once the, in, uh, the system default, uh, the default culture, meaning we can have both localized daytimes, and if somebody has some internationalized version, we can also understand that one by default, which puts us slightly ahead of daytime as input type, at least on that front. So run it. Now, we are using PowerShell classes. Even if they were the same name, I can't reuse the same function because it still points at the old definition, even if, even if I created a new class for this. One of those nasty quirks I keep stumbling around. Uh, now, this will work as the same as now string will work. I uh, apologize about this, uh, the uncommon day, uh, day of week names. It's a German machine. But it, I promise you it really is Wednesday there. OK, now we finally have almost parity with a plain daytime. Almost, because on the inside it's less convenient to use than daytime. However, now we can start the task of improving upon it. One of the things 
I usually dislike about the default types. They're like system types used in programming. They do not, you know, consider what would make this class most convenient for the user. They don't take the use case into, con into consideration because they're generic, they're easy to reuse. They're good for what, at what they're doing. Now, as an admin, one of the things I usually hate about name time is that in most instances, actually, my use case is relative to the current time. Like, I want the la exchange logs of the last three days. What happened there? Well, this is not really convenient, having to always call the me methods. And if you have to go any further in more detail, you can add minutes, hours. It's <sighs> how many times have I spent messing with that, somehow getting the output I want. So we're going to add some convenience to this. We already have a string parser. So let's add an additional parsing option. Specifically, we parse the hell out of this one. To make it simple, recreate a function. And now we can have time strings like this time in the future, they are relative to now because the parser will now split the whole input if it's not possible with the daytime parser and add up the sequence, the sequence relative to the current timestamp. So if we're gonna do this, oops, current timestamp looks right. So let's jump more than one day into the future. Work right away. This makes this call and this call equivalent. Which I must admit, the first one looks fairly precise, the second one a bit more convenient for my everyday console use. Now, let's take another look at this friggin' parser now that we know what we're gonna expecting. First of all, it will look whether it's a positive or negative value by only looking whether there is any minus in there somewhere, so you could have multiples of them, and then stripping them all out, which has proven one of the less convenient elements if I had parsed it on each segment by itself. It, minus one day, eight hours would have been minus one day plus eight hours. So this was the easiest way around it. Then we're checking whether a capital D is at the front, in which case we'll be picking up a date rather than the current time relative to it. And then we split it by a white space and parse the hell out of it until we have what we need. Adding up time spans and at the end creating the daytime from it. So if we now run the one of the date, we get the full date which is sometimes a bit more clean on the logging effort or the filtering. I often need it to have the, to have a timestamp that starts at exactly at midnight. And if you want now, just add a zero. By default, if you don't add an element, it will parse a second. Has been the most usual one, but we can just as well add milliseconds. It supports them, but milliseconds don't really show on a daytime. All right, now, we have a way to convert things, but in many cases, I really want to keep the original input because if I pass a peer session object and force it into string, well, I have to reestablish the session. I can't reuse the credentials, the credentials that were used on the first time, it's inconvenient. Same for SIM sessions or SQL server, SMO server objects. And it's simple. All you need to do is add another property input object, and on each constructor to uh, place the original input in that property. That's all you, that's needed for that. We don't really need the rest of the thing. You already seen that. Okay. Now, we have the original input object, and if we specify a string, that still works.
Now, this is it as far we can now really interpret what's coming in. The thing is, a parameter class should not only be convenient to the user that uses the functions that has the parameter, it would be great if it would also be convenient, you know, for the developer that uses it afterwards in the function. Call me prejudiced, but I don't like typing much. And in some instances, it's just, if it's a hassle, I don't use it. If I have a project and my parameter classes are too convoluted to use, they won't get used. Simple as that, or I lose contributors. So, let's see what happens if we use the parameter class in a string. Well, that's not exactly the current data I specified. Doesn't look good. This can be circumvented by adding us to a string method and controlling explicitly what it's gonna be used for. And since somehow most objects get used as a string at some time, at least if you're logging something or writing verbose messages, at least at that point, yeah, you will want a way to do that. What? No. No, the moment we added it to string method, it immediately, immediately understood it and showed it. Sorry puppies, I really like you. I love puppies, really, as long as they don't piss on my pants or something like that, as has happened on, as has happened on repeated occasions. Now, let's have some more fun with this, now that we've got the basic functionality, and accept a file system info object. I mean, it has timestamp objects, so why not just pick last write time? We usually use last write time. Uh, stay time, timestamp, so no reason not to. All right, this is the timestamp. Let's see, picked up wonderfully. Is this a good idea? Well, one of the dangers of parameter classes I've encountered, especially if you keep using them for a long time. You get a new feature request, something new that should be understood correctly, and it's convenient, and it's a workaround, so hey, why not do it? It's a short change, just a few more lines, and it works. But if you accept file system objects as input for date time, you'll be starting confusing the user. Because he doesn't get a, he might have positional binding and actually it should have gone to the next parameter, but he forgot another argument and it was bound to date time. However, now this is a legal input, it will not throw an exception because you, you know, provided bad input. So, no, generally, it should be something that logically identifies something like that. On a daytime, something that could legally be argued as a daytime. On a computer, something that legally points at a computer, you, not a, like you, you theoretically could teach a computer parameter to accept a file system and check for the host name. Uh, like a path, and just check. if it's a UNZ path, pick up the host name, otherwise pick local host. You could do this, but it would confuse the heck out of any user. Please do not do this. Now, at this point, we as the developer of the parameter class defined everything. We defined every single con uh, con conversion, every single assignment. This is neat. However, right now we're still playing pretty much a single player game. Because, you know, we are defining the, the conversions, but what if the, the user the, or the developer that tries to use our module has its own ideas about what should be a legal target? Wouldn't it be nice to give him an easy way to do this? Well, that's possible. The first thing we're gonna do is add an object, per, uh, an object uh, constructor. Then, you know, null should usually be a very quick uh, path to an exception because null is usually not a daytime. And um, don't just process the hell out of it. We'll be getting to that. The other thing we'll be needing is a static hash table. Static is, it means it's system global. It does not, you, don't, you do not need an object to access it. Which is kind of handy for this. Now, what we'll be doing is we are giving 
the foreign person working with PowerShell a way to register its, his own types into our parameter class as legal input. Because at that point, we no longer need to you know, track his project and make our project with his compatible. He can just do the job himself. That's what you pay him for, after all. So we already did some parsing. So let's process, process an object. We take the input object, check its type names on the PS object, and check whether there is something registered in the property mapping, whether the, the key exists there. And if it does, we pick the property that registered and assign it as the value. So let's see this in action. Find it. Now, at this point, we're going to be registering, again, file system info. Why not? I mean, it's still a bad idea, but we, we, at least now we as the developer didn't uh, commit that crime. And tell it, pick the property last write time. All right. At that point, we were just able to pick us off what should be legal input at that point. So now, that fact is that not everybody is comfortable with C sharp defining strongly typed classes, producing output that is known to the system. However, since we parsing the PS object type name and not the get type value, we can just create any object and give it a type name. As you can see, it is the foo.bar object. Assign it, run it. So this feature is not reserved for developers. Everybody who can do a random module, script module on the fly, can have his own custom objects registered as legal input for whatever parameter class you provide. Well, all is well, we're done. Well, not quite. You know, it's a sharp world out there with a fraud cut competition and not everything works quite well with PowerShell classes. For example, let's try running this in a run space. By the way, thank you, Bo Prox. It's an awesome module. Well, since PowerShell classes are restricted to the current run space, you have to pass through the entire definition before you can use it somewhere else, which is somewhat less convenient. There are also some additional disadvantages besides C sharp classes being processed by it. C sharp is generally a lot more performant. Now, if you're going to do a you know, computer parameter class and gonna start piping thousands of computer objects to the function, the additional overhead of PowerShell classes will start to really, really hurt your performance. So PowerShell classes are nice for a one-off quickie, but if you're going to do something in major production, do it in C Sharp. C Sharp also has a lot more language tools, which can be convenient, at least where classes are concerned. And some people still have to work with somewhat older PowerShell versions. And while I admit that I finally left the dust of PowerShell 2 behind my heels, some people have not been as fortunate. And PowerShell classes is five or uh, younger. Uh, or younger is uh, not going to happen. All right. Let's take a look at what this actually looks like if my presentation doesn't bump on me now. All right. This is the last iteration in PowerShell. Um, this is the C sharp version. And you might notice a few similarities between the two. It's almost exactly the same syntax. We just can, have, it's a bit more strict, but in the end, we didn't add much more complexity to the whole thing. And it is literally exactly the same code for the function it provides. So let's load up a latest version on both. 
Now the shop class, uh, the Z shop based par uh, parameter classes have been compiled and loaded already. And the naming should be fairly obvious. Mm, please don't do that. Let's register the same object. This is the PowerShell class version. This is the Z sharp class version. And you can see it's virtually the same thing. Now, one of the things I usually work on is the speed aspect. So let's just kind of measure how long it takes to run 1,000 copies of that. What did it do here right now? I told you to. All right, on the PowerShell class version, we have an average of 5,700 ticks, which does not me appear to be much, but if you multiply it upwards, it's starting to get ugly. And the C-sharp version is at 2,400 ticks. So that's more than double, us, double the speed. So you really notice there is a difference, and that's only part of the parameter binding. If you keep, keep adding and adding on top of it, it really multiplies upwards. So even if it's small numbers, they can bite you in the ass in the long run. So now we have the basics. One of the things I usually like to do is add additional information on it, and that's a feature that really only works well in, in Z sharp classes. Give me that. What we're adding is a new property called in the future, or in future. And it calculates whether it's in the future based on what is actually stored in the value property. This is only a new feature the rest you've already seen. So load it and well, maybe not run all that at the same time. That would probably have confusing results. Now, this is in the future, two days, hopefully. Yeah, dates match. And in the past, it's no longer in the future. This is a basic example of what you can do. What I have in other parameter classes, for example, for the computer name parameter class, whether it's localhost or not. Because lots of function code has to act differently depending on whether it's localhost or not. It enumerates the network adapters, IP addresses, checks for other attributes on that, and just shows whether it's localhost or not. So you can do advanced processing and provide this as a functionality to the developer that uses uh, the coder or contributor that uses it in the function without having to do all the recalculation within the script code. Okay, now we're gonna cheat. I love cheating. In games, well, not in multiplayer games, admittedly. But in this instance, what we're going to add is an implicit operator. This tells the system, yes, you can convert this to daytime by offering a daytime shop C parameter class and returning the value instead. This allows you to use the parameter class within your function pretty much the same way as if it were daytime. No properties accessed, nothing. You can just run it. So let's see how that plays out. We're gonna create an object which is a bit in the past. And this is probably not gonna be newer than today. So this returns true and we can pass it as a parameter that expects a daytime without having to do anything at all. This allows us in many situations to retrofit functions simply by replacing the parameter type and not having to go through the code and inspect everything. Except for one thing that can screw you up, which is when you do it the other way around. That's gonna error. Anybody in the audience capable of telling me why this just bombed on us? It's converting to the different types Oh, it does the coercion perfectly. 
because in, uh, this time in PowerShell, when you do comparis uh, comparisons, it usually converts the one on the right side to the type of the one on the left side, which in this instance will use the constructor of the parameter class, but the parameter class itself does not implement comparison features, so it does not can, you, it, you can't compare two iterations of a parameter class with each other yet. It's a feature we could be adding, and in many cases that works perfectly fine, in others it does not, and due to some hard-coded code apparently, for daytime it does not work perfectly, even if you do. I tried a lot. All right, any questions so far? For the uh, C sharp classes, that means that you're writing it your class is written in C-sharp code, right? Exactly. Okay. And, but that, if you do go that route, then you are able to implement classes in uh, PowerShell 4, for example. Exactly. Or 3 or 2. I've used this feature for several years on PowerShell 2 with excellent results. Thank you, Warren. Or Mike, in this case. Any other questions? <coughs> I have a question. So if you're using a C sharp class, uh, could that be like a could it be a child class from a derived class where maybe you have like your built in comparison features, your two strings, things like that? You can totally have it an inherited class from somebody, something else. All it needs is the constructors. And constructors are fairly agnostic to whatever you implement. So you're totally free to have that. I have from my framework module a uh, base class for parameter classes and inherit the individual parameter classes from it. For example, the input object is on every single parameter class I built. So I just decided to go, to, go whole hog and implement it as that. Yes? What did we need to implement um, when, if we were working with a type that had you know, working comparison logic? What would that look like in our class? Um, don't have that memorized, actually. It's an operator. Mm, no, not that one. It's similar in operation like the implicit operator, but I'd have to look it up. I don't memorize that kind of thing. Okay, that's, Sorry. That's but it's absolutely doable, and so long as there's no um, implementation conflict uh, or parser conflict, which you risk encountering when you, when you address base language types because they often do shortcuts there because hey, it's more efficient and you don't need to reinvent the string. Can you declare it implements that interface? Can you declare that it implements I comparable? For comparison, yes, I comparable uh, interface and it will work. For calculations, you need to, uh, to implement the mathematic operators been doing that as well. Yes? With this approach where you're uh, basically typing your, um, your parameters with your class, the, the availability of the class only matters um, within the function. You don't have to worry about if your class has been imported in a module in such a way to make it available to everything else because it's only being called from within your function. Right? Yes. No. The, if you if you do define the C sharp if you define the class in PowerShell, and you make it the proper the parameter type of the function, yes. And somebody call that function if you if it's if all this is in a module, right? Yes. Your 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 PowerShell class and your function that takes a, a parameter of that type. Do they not have to call using module in order for that to work? They have to uh, import the library, but they do not have to import the entire module actually. If it's, if it's in C-sharp? Yes. Yeah, right. PowerShell classes, I haven't used parameter classes of PowerShell in production because, frankly, I usually have a minimum PowerShell version requirement of version 3. So at that point, that's a game over anyway for me. So with PowerShell classes, I must admit I haven't crossed all the I's. With PowerShell, if it's defined in a PowerShell class, the user would have to call using module the module in order for the class to be available. But if it's a C-sharp class, and the module does an add type or a... You know, Require assembly. Then it's available as soon as it's imported. It's automatic. Yes. Okay. All right. The 
downside, of course, being that you can't unload it ever. Mm, yes, it can be kind of irritating, for, especially when you try to iterate, iterate on it and debug. But it's generally worth the pain in comparison on the long term, especially since the conversion does have its pitfalls. All right. Now. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at one of my favorite parameter classes in the field, and that's in the DBA tools project. I work a lot on the DBA tools module, uh, module. as a, the infrastructure, archi infrastructure architect. I do all the backend work of that module, like logging, configuration management, and amongst other things, parameter interpretation. And this is what our developers uh, get for the function building as the input type DBA instance, which accepts pretty much anything you could throw at it that legally points as a DBA instance, a SQL Server instance. If you find something it doesn't accept, please tell me. I'll be most grateful at that point, and I'll be very happy to implement it. As you can see, we have got the is local host property. We also added some input validation. For example, this is not exactly a legal computer host name, because the white spaces are usually frowned upon, so we're not going to do that. So you can also very easily implement validation into the same thing. And at the same time, if you uh, benefit from the pipeline, terminating it before even begin runs, because it's also a parameter binding error, similar to what happens if you have a validate attribute. It also picks up instance names and, of course, validates them. Now, the, in the DBA tools project, we have by now more than 380 commands. And if we try to really update something across all these commands, it would be a major pain. The parameter class has allowed us to scale out the parameter validation, what we actually accept as input, on an incredible scale. For example, I was asked to provide support for SQL Server connection strings. And it took me about half an hour to update 380 commands to support that. Yes? In your uh, DBA instance class, can you also uh, validate Unicode characters in the database? Um, no, I've got a, uh, for instance names, I've got, uh, you can't use the reserved keywords. Something like select is forbidden because it's a official reserved keyword. So that will uh, bump on you, but other than that, I do not any do, do, I can't catch all validation scenarios. I'm doing a best effort here on that. But yes, this will accept an active, direct, active directory computer. You can ping a connection string. Looks like a charm. And since we have the input object, the internal connection command can reuse connection strings or already connect established connections with credentials without having to pass it through everything. All right. Now, I'm the author of the PS Framework module, and I've already done quite a bit of the work. So I'm publishing parameter classes in that module, specifically the computer, daytime, and uh, time span parameter classes. And you can use them just like in the example. So if your module, for example, builds on the PS framework and has an output type that is a computer, you can register it. And another module that does not know your module but still uses the PS, uh, PS framework can accept it as legal input without having to know your code. All right. If there are not any more questions, that's it. Thank you for your attention.